Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately titled IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. And as part of our efforts to promote play, we've introduced Porch Play Chats. And these are just conversations with people who are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find all the Porch Play Chats. There's over 165 of them soon to be turned into podcasts on our website at ipausa.org in that top right hand corner. Um, follow us on Instagram, be a friend on our Facebook page and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And magically every Monday morning, a new porch play chat will appear in your feed. I'm Deb Lawrence and I'm president of IPA USA. With me on the porch today is Dr. Charlene Wood of Brinkman, who is an early childhood consultant and a resource recess play researcher she's a problem solver this is what i love about her bio with cheap magic up her sleeve and also joining us is dr kathy ramstetter who is a school health consultant excuse me with successful healthy children that assists schools with wellness initiatives and recess implementation to protect recess for every child and you will you may find Dr. Ramstetter's name familiar because she is the co-author of the American Academy of Pediatrics Policy on Recess and is a part a founding member of the Global Recess Alliance. So, so to have you back. Today we're talking about, I'm so excited. I'm sorry, I've been- We're glad to be like here. I know, I'm so happy you're here. Benefits of recess for social, emotional learning and well-being. Oh, please. Let's talk about this because I feel like we're still not doing what we need to do with recess. It's kind of driving me crazy. What should we do? What's happening? Have more of it. Every kid uh-huh. should have it every day. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, I, this is um, not specific necessarily to, self, to social emotional learning, but, you know, the three of us were in Glasgow this summer at the IPA world. Um, and I found it fascinating. We did a panel discussion. Um, I moderated a panel discussion with um, some of our Global Recess Alliance members um, from the UK and Australia, and then several from, of us from the States. And we, we were speaking to a room of international play advocates, right? And there were people that were, I mean, not, they weren't surprised. Appalled, they were appalled, surprised. Yeah, that, <laughs> That to at the state of our recess mm-hmm. situation in the United States, in particular, that kids don't have breaks from learning after the age of sixth grade, pretty much at all. And in some schools, it's even before then, as in Charlene's grandchild's case. Um, and and the time is so minuscule compared to other countries' mm-hmm. time dedicated for recess and break time from learning from this structured environment and and then i'm not surprised when we look at our kids and we are our students are struggling with their executive functioning with their with their social well-being and their emotional readiness to be in relation with other people Mm -hmm. Um, so i i just i think you know the one of the a big takeaway from that conference in Glasgow was that we have so much to learn in our country, in the United States, from how other countries embrace break time and rest, and it's part of their their life, and it's it starts in schools, right? And it's so, I think it's embarrassing. It's (laughs) kind of like when Philip Jaffe was asking children questions about why play is important. And I had thrown in that question and said, please ask this question. And one of the students from one of the the schools up on the stage said, why hasn't the USA ratified the convention on the rights of the child? And you could hear all of the people who were, we had 63 people there from the US, all the people from the US who may not have been aware of that go, but the rest of the world that was there, those 550 people gasped at, that we had not read the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I mean, we have so much to learn. It is an embarrassment at times. 
yeah. to say you're from the U.S. It, it is. This is just one of many factors where we are not doing what's best for children. We're not. And, right. and we can learn so much I, from other countries and what other countries are doing. And I think this is, this is where we really need to be sharing. How do other countries do this? How, how do other countries... I mean, do they have the suicide rates that we have? You know, they don't. Do, do they have, you know, do they have these test scores that people are flipping out about that they feel are not adequate? Probably not because they respect children and respect this right to have some rest and some right. relaxation and a break from right. academics, right? So- how, how do we, why is, let's just start with why is recess so important to this emotional well-being? Kathy, do you want to start? Well, I was just going to ask you if you wanted to start. Um, okay. I'll let you go first. All right. Well, um, as we all know, there are five major components to social emotional learning. And generally, those are considered self-awareness, self-management social awareness, relational skills, and responsible decision-making. Mm -hmm. And none of those things can you bubble A, C, or D. They're not on the test. <laughs> um, so the playground is where we learn those things. Um, that is the, it is the ultimate landscape for the ultimate classroom, if you will, for the, these things, because, um, for example, responsible decision making, um, as Peter Gray says, if children don't follow the rules that other children set, they don't get to play. Um, children set the rules in true play. And so therefore, recess is a wonderful landscape for teaching social emotional skills and for establishing that learning. Kathy? Yeah, and I, I think that's true. Re recess is a time to learn them, but it's also a time to practice those skills with peers. So for example, let's, let's look at particularly self-management and social awareness. Those are things that can be, that can be taught in a classroom, that can be taught in a sort of objective structured way that you, you all, you're going to have to sit here and do this task that I'm instructing and telling you to do, correct? And you have to be aware that you're in, interfering or interrupting other people if you're doing something that we're not doing. You're interfering mm -hmm. with their ability to learn. Those are things that an adult, a teacher, is telling a child to do so that they can be in a group setting, right? But on the class, on the playground, then there's that time to practice it, to make their own rules, to, to be peer to peer in that same place of management and kind of negotiating their own, yeah. their own decisions. And, and that, that is an opportunity to practice those decision-making and that social awareness of, well, if I choose to do this, if I choose to button line to get on the playground slide, then I'm, I'm upsetting my friend. You know that, so I'm going to become aware of my friend, but I'm also at the same time learning to follow rules from and with my peers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those are those are critical things for us to do in life. You know, if you button somebody at line at the airport, they're going to be really mad at you. So you better learn that when you're in kindergarten. <laughs> right, right, and and again, these are life skills that Correct. they'll use forever. Right. I, I don't know about you, but I wasn't so good in uh, Algebra 2. I don't think I've ever used Algebra 2 ever again in my life. I have used math. It just wasn't Algebra 2. But what I learned on the playground and what I learned with playing with others, I've used every day. Right. And, and so I think we have to figure out what is it that, what is the outcome? Do we want functional humans who can interact in appropriate ways and make good and make decisions that are good, not just for them, but for others and follow the rules as long as the rules are just right. I, I'm going to put that caveat on there and then, and then be able to critically think problem solve and function as a human, which we're not doing when, 
they're just drooled and killed all day long. And there's no, I mean, think about, think about how you feel when you've been at work and it's been really stressful and the phone's ringing and you're trying to do all this stuff and you in your head say, I need a break. People who are in the workplace get breaks during the day. We don't seem to think children need those. And I, and I think that's to our detriment. I, I, I well, 100% agree. Yeah. And, you know, Deb, something you said that was very important was that, you know, when the rules are fair, when they're just, and that's an excellent example of when children learn to self-advocate, you know, to have self-agency, to be able to say, hey, that's not a fair rule and I don't want to play this game any longer. And that's a huge piece of this as well. Yes. And, and if they're told what to do all day and told how long to do it and told how to do it, what thinking is involved in that? It's just almost like, I mean, they're not a robot, robot that you're programming. They're a human. And so I, it, it's, right. it's frustrating to me that we see children as these tools to achieve outcomes that we want, but yet we, we put barriers in place by not allowing them choice and freedom on the playground and recess and the ability to develop the these social emotional skills we are having a problem with the outcomes that we're getting but we don't seem to understand we just want more of it instead of taking a step back and saying probably not a good idea I mean we're on the hamster wheel and we can't seem to get off of it so, it's like saying the soup's too salty, but you continue to add salt. Yes, exactly. And so I get. I think my guess is in your work with schools or in your work in advocating for this social emotional well being for in having recess, how do you go about convincing superintendents, administrators that this is an important element of what they want? every child to achieve. How do we do that? Kathy, you wanna take the lead on that one? I think we lost Kathy for a minute. Hopefully she'll come right back in. Oh no, okay. Um, well, so the first thing is showing them the research um, because most superintendents data speaks louder than anything else. Um, <laughs> and showing them the impact on academics is critical. Um, mm -hmm. Because the research supports the fact that academic scores actually increase when we increase recess, increase breaks, increase time for de-stressing, increase time for mindfulness, and time, you know, increase time for play and hands-on engaging learning. So all of those things support stronger academic outcomes. Mm -hmm. So if you can start with that, then you should have them at least listening. Right. And then because to say... You know, they want yes, those test scores to go up. And they so, want those test scores to go up. And most people just intrinsically believe that physical activity is the only benefit to recess. Mm -hmm. And, okay, well, it is a benefit, but these other things are so powerful as well. So, of course, yes, we want children to not be obese. We want them to be healthy and fit. So, therefore, this is a benefit as well. But then social-emotional learning. Um, you know, most superintendents should want calmer schools and better functioning schools, schools where there's a stronger mental health um, aspect across the board, students and staff. So if we can show them that learning how to be self-aware can help students to de-escalate themselves, to self-check in, to use their own coping strategies, they're going to have less time off instruction and off task being pulled out for behavior issues and having the entire class disrupted for those behavior issues if we can teach students these skills. Um, so, so I think what, you, what you're saying is, and, and Kathy, we, we were talking about what, how do you get to these superintendents and principals and administrators to engage them in having a conversation about the importance of recess. And I, and Charlene is immediately going to, you know, what, what do you need, right? What do you want? You have to make it individual to each administrator or superintendent 
And then did you know, blah, 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 blah. And then this is how you can reach the goals or, or the, the um, outcomes that you're looking for by doing this, this, and this, and giving them the data that they need. Because superintendents are very data-driven, right? So that's, they're looking at the test score saying, your teachers need to do a better job. We need to buy another $5 billion curriculum to strengthen math skills. And more, and, and more computers. And, and more, more computers. computers. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Instead of, let's look at the child as a holistic system. And that cognition, their cognitive development is one facet of their development. And this is how paying attention to social and emotional development, paying attention to physical, fine and gross motor development, paying attention to language development can help you with that cognitive development, right? So it, I, I really think it's that I think it's a smart approach to go in and say, what is it that you're struggling with? Every, every principal will tell you, I'm so tired of all these behavior problems. Children are just not able to solve problems. And you can say, well, what, what opportunities during the school day do they have to practice that? Well, we bought this social emotional curriculum and the teachers are supposed to be doing it. I mean, really, I hear them because I've talked to them about these things. And I'm like, but when do they have time to practice? So it goes back to what Kathy was talking about. Yes, you can give them some strategies in the classroom, but they really need to be able to practice them with their peers. Yeah. And so, yes. you know, so it's all, I, I'm not quite sure why. And, and I know it's because, you know, the governor calls them and says our test scores are awful and you need to do something about it. And then the Department of Education in that state says, these test scores are awful and you need to do something. So I'm trying to figure out, do we do it principal and superintendent by principal and superintendent, or do we need to do something more systemic and work from both ends, from the top and from the bottom? I think, I think it is an approach from the top and the bottom. Um, and I, I think a challenge that it's the, something that we've just all three have talked a little bit around is that there's there's big money, big corporation involvement in what we're doing in our schools, right? And the assessment industry is a billion dollar industry as is the sale of packaged curriculum, tech savvy curricula for schools to deliver the deliverables that are going to be measured by this assessment mechanism that we're going to also have to buy. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we can ignore that. I think it's, it's a challenge that from what I gather is probably more present in the United States than it is in other countries, although it has hit the United Kingdom pretty hard in the last 10 years with this with this need to have all this objective data and technology. It's it is heartening to see out of the aftermath of the ill effects of COVID on our schools that there are companies that are recognizing how and are implementing utilizing tech in ways that can support our students in their whole child, whole student learning and growth, um, where technology can be used in ways that allow for teachers to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with students that is not a public vehicle, that allows for students to be engaged in their own learning and their own assessment of their learning. But that's that's not the norm right now, right? The norm right now is we have all this standardized testing and teachers are being expected to deliver on those outcomes, which are the standardized test scores, right? So the whole month of March or April, depending or both in whatever state you're in, is spent with it's testing time. Um, and then May hits and the school's over. Um, and then we spend all of September trying to get ourselves back on board to have our October testing thing. And then to have the all, it just, it is, it's a cycle. So when you talk about from the top down, I think that's going to be a little bit 
not a little bit, that's a lot more of a challenge than being from a grassroots or a local rule. Plus we recognize local rule. I mean, if, even, if the, even if the Department of Education at the federal level says we should do all this, it's not gonna come with any kind of real way to deliver it from Oklahoma to Hawaii to San Francisco to New York. I mean, there's just not going to be one way to do it across the country like that, which I think is another challenge that is unique to the United States. We have so many different contexts than mm -hmm. other countries do in the world that have a much more homogenous kind of uh, makeup, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, so that gets back to Charlene's idea of really speaking school administrator language, seeing what schools, I mean, the school's purpose is to educate our children. That's the taxpayers charge to our school leaders, educate our children. But the expectation from our taxpayers that these, is that students are not just educated and can do algebra two, is that they come out and they can function in society and get a job and be tr the contributing members of our society, be civic minded, responsible citizens. That's, if we don't have, if we don't have an educated populace, we're gonna have a hard time keeping a democracy going. I mean, exactly. Kayla Freire would tell us that a long Even, time ago. <laughs> yeah. And Miles Wharton. <laughs> Workforce development is such a huge buzzword right now. But collaboration is one of the biggest workforce development yes. skills that needs to be taught. It's a social so, skill. <laughs> it is. Let's see. Do you want a workforce that can collaborate? Or do you want people that do not know how to collaborate? Because mm -hmm. right now, we have children in a Petri dish and we're not going to produce adults that can collaborate unless we do something different. Yeah. Um, I was just told about another school this week that it is a fourth and fifth grade school and they do not have recess at all because of their instructional minutes requiring you know, all of their time. And so this fourth and fifth graders do not have any recess at all. They have PE three days a week and the teachers are told, well, that suffices. But even that's taken away for behavior. So uh -huh. when do these kids get to let off steam? And how you are know? they going to learn to focus? And I just want us to take us, take us back to the human perspective. As an adult, I need breaks from my desk. I get up, I go to the bathroom. I go get a drink at the water cooler. I go and walk outside for 15 minutes. And when I come back, I'm more focused and I'm ready to get started again. Why isn't, why don't we see that same need for young children? So I, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is if we are trying to help local, state, and national strategically is it is it focusing because you're right the department of education is just going to set these guidelines of here's how many times you have to test children and and then locally is it we go to families who say my kids have such high anxiety they don't even want to go to school you know my children my grandchildren, um, two of my grandchildren um, do not take state tests. Their parents say, nope, they're not gonna be there. They're very bright kids. They would probably do really well. <laughs> but they say, we're not gonna do that. You're not gonna, we're not gonna put them through that stress. When I was visiting student teachers in public schools, I would walk in, unfortunately, during March or April. And there were big signs that said, countdown to testing and you know teachers were stressed out kids were stressed out the horror stories I heard about testing so you know I think we have to be strategic in the approaches that we take and I think your approach is strategic walking well, into these superintendents and principals and saying what do you need what do you what are your issues and then address it but here's the thing, though, Deb. Yes, we've got to we've got to go into superintendents and say, are you trying to get your academic scores up? Recess and play can help that. Are you trying to settle your behavior problems? Recess and play can help that. 
But at the same time, you know, one of the things that Kathy and I do is that we um, present a workshop on, on teaching parents how to advocate, mm-hmm. teaching community members how to advocate, because the superintendent may have blinders on and be very tunnel vision that it's only about the test scores. It's only about this or this. But if the parents can come in and say, hey, my child has anxiety every day coming to school. And I have been told that the research says A, B, and C. We even made a little cheat sheet of tip cards with our business card information. But in the middle of it is a cheat sheet for parents to tell you know, what the research says that um recess and play supports and how it supports social emotional learning and then also um you know it, the other side of the cheat sheet is what the components of an effective recess look like because unstructured play is the backbone of that not a second it, piece of time and it can't be 15 minutes right correct. it takes much longer than that for correct. children to be able to figure out what they're going to play to figure out who's going to be playing that thing and to get engaged and well, so you know, I- I was observing on a campus last year that had two 10 minute recesses for their fifth graders. And by the time they got, got outside and the whistle blew to go back in, it was four minutes and six minutes. Yeah. It's crazy. You can't even pick teams in four minutes. No, no. (laughs) So I think, so what I'd love to do is when, when you come back for another porch play chat, I'd love us to talk about, the parent advocacy piece and how you're working with families. Because I think that will help directors and public school teachers be able to advocate for, to help parents advocate for what's happening in the school. And and the other other topic I think we really need to focus on is is the, the data, the specific data that you're able to pull based on what the superintendent is saying or what the principal is saying when parents are coming to them saying we need more recess right what my kids need to get out and be able to play for a little bit a couple of times a day for longer than 15 minutes and and then to help maybe have a have a discussion about a sort of a guide, what makes sense? You know, Debbie Ray's wonderful project um, it is one approach and one that makes great sense, but what might be an idea for kindergarten through third grade, third grade through fifth grade, middle school and secondary, what might be something like a I don't want to. I don't want to make it a schedule. But what might be some things to think about? How can you plan and not count specials as recess? Because it's not specials are specials. Recess is recess. And I and so I think that's. I think we need to dive deeper into these things and think about strategies that we can give to folks. Because you've given us lots of great ones. Strategies that we can give to people so that they can take the piece that they're most interested in and run with it. So what do you think? Oh, I, I love that. I think what, you know, what you're suggesting is that we would, our next discussion would be, here's the data about, here's a, here's a list of data that you can provide for your, your teachers, your principals, your community members, if you have to convince taxpayers in a boardroom or a board of education, this is why it's important that recess is occurring. So that list of talking points basically. Mm-hmm. And then um, perhaps a framework or models for recess design and implementation. Yes. Cross grades. Yes. I think that will be, I think those are, tangible Mm -hmm. tools that people can use as resources and then I put all that stuff within the chat so that people can access it so that that's where that's where I we've got a couple minutes but that's where I think we'll we'll provide additional support for this dilemma that America is in you know one of the things that I use when I talk about the use of technology um, with young children, right, so, and don't use it, um, is the world guidelines, right? What 
Germany says, what Finland says, what, you know, and then what the U.S. is, is, and it's totally different. And people are like, why are we, why do we say as a recommended practice that here's how much screen time children should have when in some countries there's no screen time for children under two and, or there's limited screen time for children who are over six. And so I think, I think when people see those differences, then they begin to go, oh, I thought everybody did what we do instead of being like, oh my God, <laughs> we are so far off the mark. Yeah. So and even I if we followed our own, like the AAP guidelines, five, two, one. So it's five fruits and vegetables, two hours screen time max a day and one hour of physical activity for children of all ages. Mm-hmm. And then we throw our kids in school. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, remember I said two hours yeah. of screen time. Right. And they're six. And then we hand them a device and say, here, learn on this all day. Uh-huh. That's not, that's not what we should be doing. No. So, okay. So we have, I don't know, six sports play checks coming up. So stay tuned. <laughs> yes, because I want to throw this in, Deb. We also are doing some uh, very important work right now in um, developing um, professional development for supervision of recess of recess um, so that we don't interfere with them. we have seen that m- many many of the people that are asked to supervise recess don't have any training so therefore they're either ignoring students and letting things occur or they're micromanaging students to the point where play is not occurring okay. so you know so we are we are also doing some work in that area as well and so yeah we've got like you know eight porch chats or eight. 10 i chats think there's that. eight or 10 coming up <laughs> all right well don't go anywhere i'm going to close this out so um if, to learn more about ipa usa please visit our website at ipausa.org and until next time keep on playing get get out and have some recess yes